since TNA, excuse me, I guess technically Impact Wrestling, started its downward slide about a decade ago, uh, the wrestling business had a gap, it had a void here in North America. And that was the need or desire or the want for a second major wrestling promotion. Whether you wanted them to be a threat in pure competition to WWE or not, as much as anything else, you wanted an alternative, right? So late in 2019, you see AEW launch. And they are taking their stab and their shot at filling the void. And in some ways, they're doing an admirable job. You know, and they've been in existence, you know, you could say four years now. It's been almost four years since their inaugural show back on, what was it, October 2nd, 2019? That was a long time ago already. That time does go by pretty quickly. And, and they've made it and they've survived so far and maybe even had some moments where they've thrived a little bit. But maybe some moments that kind of underwhelmed. But now that we're a few years into AEW, I wonder if it's time for fans to start worrying, maybe at least just a little bit. Um, not panic, not overreact too much. You know, this is really tough for AEW fans. Uh, not get too overly emotional about it. You know, AEW fans are really passionate and sometimes really psychotic and could really benefit from touching some grass. Your company is not perfect, and it is okay every once in a while to admit that they did something that was less than great. It's okay. It doesn't make you a bad fan. It just kind of makes you connected with the fucking real world. I'm just saying. But you have to be careful when it comes to AEW. Not because of the fans. Because fuck them. You have to be careful with AEW because it is unfair to put them in the WWE light and do like that straight up WWE comparison. This is a valid point to say WWE has like a six decade head start in terms of the domestic and international infrastructure that they've built. That is absolutely true. Like they're in an entirely different stratosphere as a promotion. That is also absolutely true, especially from a business standpoint. How could you refute that? It's fair to say that in a few years, AEW's done a decent job of finding their niche stake in their claim, getting their foothold, and being able to hold it relatively so. And that is true too. And for a company that's been in existence for less than four years to have come out of the gates like they did with some of the attention that they did and not just completely fall flat off of the face of the earth, well, that's, that's a good thing, right? Now, let's be clear it's not like they're this big time underdog company. You know, they're backed by the con money. So you have billionaires backing this brand, which is maybe more of a representation of how something like wrestling should be done. Like you want to have significant deep financial resources so you can not be so worried about trying to turn a profit right away. You can really invest resources into the long-term health, stability and growth of the company. That's how it should be, right? Think of it as a startup. When you start up a company initially, you likely are going to lose money. You know, Amazon, for example, has become an evil monster now, but for years they didn't profit. <laughs> in some cases, by choice. They said, we're going to continue to reinvest. We're going to lose money intentionally and look at where they are now. And, you know, it's also not fair to compare them to WWE with respect to the type of brand that they are, the type of product that they are, the type of audience that they're targeting is not the same as WWE. It's just not. AEW has made a business decision for right or wrong, and probably in some cases a bit of both, to really target that hardcore, rabid wrestling fan base. And that hardcore wrestling fan base has largely, largely stayed true to them the past few years. This is a company that is able to do multiple pay-per-views following the traditional pay-per-view model, but they haven't overdone it. You know, and most reports you see with the pay-per-view buys, and when their pay-per-views run every three months or so, the pay-per-view numbers are solid, right? Overall, their attendance is solid. It's not jammed to the rafters every week. It's not 15, 20,000 people every show, 
but it's not pathetic either. You know, jokes about, oh, that must have been a big hard cam sign with all those empty seats. Hey, sometimes shit happens. Like, I've been to WWE shows that were half empty or more. It happens. Um, so, there are some really good things about AEW. And especially when you look at the investment that Warner Brothers has put into them. Um, in terms of two hours of prime time every Wednesday with Dynamite. An hour with Rampage every Friday night. Now two hours of Collision every Saturday night. A couple of Battle of the Belt specials every year. You know, it's clear that they have a really good relationship with their TV partner and their TV partner believes in them. And for each of those shows that come out, just like WWE, AEW is getting revenue for that, right? So there's some good things there. But as I look at the bigger picture, a couple of things give me some pause about this company long term. Not in terms of doomsday scenario that they're going to die or anything that. Nah. I think the only way that AEW would totally go away at this point is one, if they lost their television deal with Warner Bros. Discovery all of a sudden and nobody wanted to take them on. Two, if Tony Khan and Shad Khan didn't want to put their money behind the project anymore. That's probably the only way they fully go away, realistically. But in terms of their product in the long term, I do have a couple of concerns. One, we just talked about Collision. Now you're talking about you've got a second primetime show, this one in a less than desirable time slot of Saturday night, that in part you created because of some backstage bitching and drama behind the scenes where the boys didn't want to play with each other nicely. And as a result, you got to keep them separate and apart because they don't want to fucking do business together. Like, let's cut the shit. You say, hey, the network offered to give them this two-hour slot every Saturday night, maybe contingent upon CM Punk being there, but it's the fact that they even had to do that. Like, that's not good. And in my opinion, that points to a dereliction of leadership by Tony Khan and clearly evident that he's more focused on being liked and being everybody's friend versus being the boss. And sometimes you need to be the boss and sometimes people will hate you more for being the boss, but they will respect you more for being the boss. They will work harder for you more when you are the boss at those key moments in time. And sometimes trying to be nice to everybody can make you as unpopular as possible even more so than if everybody hated you. Because sometimes if everybody hates you, it might be because you're pushing their buttons right. It could be because you're helping to get more out of them. So when I look at this, I say, now you've got CM Punk and a bunch of your talent in this kind of death slot on Saturday night. The debut show did over 800,000 viewers. is an okay number, but it wasn't fantastic, but it's about what we projected. You know, I thought week two, maybe they were gonna do 650,000 viewers and they didn't even cross 600,000 viewers. And you want to talk about the demo, the demo dropped quite a bit too. I think it was like a 35, 40% in the key demo from week one to week two. That's not good. That's a rampage type of decline. Did you just create a Saturday night rampage that's two hours long? Yikes. And when you think about that, that show being there represents a lack of control at the top of the house. It represents the talent not being able to put their egos and their bullshit aside for the greater good. And it represents a scenario where, let's say you look at CM Punk and you could certainly point to some evidence where when he came in initially to AEW, he was their biggest drawing star. Now you've put him in the spot where he ends up on the secondary show and a secondary night, secondary time slot. He will start to feel more like a secondary star. And the others that are associated with that show will feel less important by nature. And we haven't even gotten to a place where, hey, this show's collision is going to be running up against SummerSlam or other pay-per-views in the months ahead. Yeah, got some concerns. I've also got some concerns about some of the choices in terms of how they choose their locations in terms of events. Like, they go back to Chicago a lot, and it really worked there for Punk's debut, Collision's debut. But then you go to Canada... And the Saturday Night Collision show, like half of the arena was tarped off. Now, you could sit there and say on the flip side, you know, you also were running Forbidden Door there the next night. That event was sold out and that was a good thing, right? That's another example where the company generated some really good revenue for the paper, from their pay-per-view. But 
you know, this isn't exactly a company that's seeing their audience growing. And as much as hardcore fans might want to stubbornly clutch onto and protect this product that they love so much, by only appealing to them, it could be a problem because eventually some of those hardcore fans will start to drift away. It's natural. It's already happened with this company the past few years. They've lost a couple hundred thousand of their hardcore fans, even when you go to Dynamite. That show a year or two ago is a, towing around a million viewers, maybe some weeks a little bit over a million, some weeks a little bit under, and now you're lucky to get in the high 700,000, low 800,000 range, and that overall number matters. The demo matters in terms of the advertisers and advertiser revenue, sure, but total number of eyeballs on your live television product absolutely fucking matters too, no matter how much Meltzer tries to spin it, that it doesn't, it fucking does. And they're not growing their audience. And in fact, you look at each of these shows, Rampage feels almost entirely irrelevant. Dynamite's kind of your flagship franchise show, and it doesn't have the same five or buzz about it. Collision's not exactly off to a hot start. And then you look at the talent, and you look at some of these guys, and you see some continual trends here of these guys that could be really big deals are put in situations where they look stupid. Guys like Wardlow, guys like Ricky Starks, etc. You see, you know, whereas somebody like Orange Cassidy has been booked really, really well, almost to the point of being too well to be believable in some cases, you see so many of these other guys and you're like, what's the big deal? I've seen so many people be brought into AEW and I hear about, oh my God, Malachi Black's going to be a difference maker. He ain't a difference maker for shit, right? And we can run down the fucking list. And it concerns me that I already have questions about Tony Khan and his booking style and his vision and understanding how to build and develop characters on a consistent basis, how to create narratives and stories that will hook the fans and get them to draw in, draw in new fans. Like I've got all of those concerns already and now you're adding even more to his plate. You say, well, he brought in somebody to help him. How much are they really going to be helping here? It's still going to be Tony Khan's show. And then you throw in the ROH shit. Like that's another piece that really concerns me with this company is that Tony Khan and the company are just spread out too much. They're spread too thin. And eventually what does that do? That's going to knock away and dilute everything. And you saw that happen with WWE. So it stands the reason that it would happen with an AEW as well. When I look at this company, it's a lot of product for them to, to put out there. They're not growing. They're not really developing characters. They're not doing things that really get you hooked in. You can sit there and throw out all these matches all you want that'll pop your hardcore fans, but you're already starting to lose some of your hardcore fans and the numbers back that up and support it. Right? A couple of years ago, if you ran two nights in Canada, guarantee you're selling out the full arena both nights. They didn't do that now. Because some of that buzz around the initial you know, launch of AEW and the excitement of it, that's gone away. And now you're running a more business as usual shop. Now you've got a great opportunity with All In at Wembley Stadium at the end of August. Put 90 fucking thousand people in there and that should give you a real shot in the arm. But they, maybe they're doing some big shows right, but that consistent week in, week out stuff. The overuse of gimmick shows, the overuse of this, the over-reliance on bringing people in and bringing in new talent and then you don't properly feature the ones that you already have. It does give me a little pause and it does lead me to have some concern for AEW in the long term. And I hope this is just kind of a natural growing pain that a company that's not quite new anymore but they are not 60 years in the business and they've hit a little speed bump and they've got to learn some things, maybe the hard way, um, go through some growing pains, maybe the the, the navigate that and come out better on the other side. But what I've seen out of this company so far this year, at least, you know, we're halfway through 2023. It does give me some pause and it does give me some concern. And I feel like AEW fans should be connected enough with reality and controlled enough over their emotions to be able to acknowledge like, Hey, I still love this product, but there are some things that concern me and the things that could be done better. And if they aren't done better, this shit could get a little bit worse in the months ahead. Maybe a lot worse.